this important topic. Uh, I'm Ryan Kaufman. I'm a family doc in Bellfountain, and I've worked with the OAFP in a variety of quality improvement and board certification initiatives over the years. I look forward to sharing more about the ABFM with you in tonight's session. The OAFP was awarded an American Board of Family Medicine AFP constituent chapter pilot grant to execute an uh, initiative focused on delivering personalized certification planning consultations for members who are ABFM diplomates. We posted two in-person sessions earlier in this year in conjunction with our group KSA sessions, but due to the pandemic, our final two sessions were canceled. But thanks to technology and the shift in virtual learning this year, we put together this webinar to replace those sessions. Thank you to the ABFM for this opportunity and for the support of this program. First, a few housekeeping announcements, and then we'll jump right into the material. Everyone is currently muted. If you have questions as we get started, please use the chat box and our staff will be behind the scenes facilitating getting those questions to us. For general questions, please share them with everyone so that we can all stay together. But we also have private chat if you'd like to say hello to any of your friends who are on uh, the conference tonight. We've scheduled 15 minutes for question and answers after the first portion of the session. During this time, please feel free to share questions or comments in the chat box or raise your hand and then we can go ahead and unmute you and you can share your question on video. The staff will be monitoring the chat and we'll uh, call out uh, those individuals with their hands raised who'd like to speak. The session will be recorded and we will post it on the OAP website. So if you wanna go back and review things or share it with colleagues, it will be there for you. We will also share a PDF of this presentation slides from this evening. Our uh, session this evening has been approved for 1.25 AAFP live prescribed credits. There uh, will not be an enduring credit uh, for the recorded session. Uh, so do claim it as live credit tonight. Uh, an evaluation will be mail, emailed to attendees after the webinar and posted on the website to fill out and submit uh, for a CME certificate for your file. You are responsible for reporting your credit on your own to the AAFP. If you have questions as we get started, please put those in the chat box and we will do our best to assist you. Also on our session tonight, we're fortunate to have uh, representatives from the American Board of Family Medicine. Uh, feel free to message them as well and, and they will be speaking to you a little bit later this evening. We have uh, Aaron Myrie, who is a certification program manager, Kevin Graves, who's strategic project manager, and Ashley Webb, who is the director of outreach. To get us started, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Elizabeth Baxley, who is the ABFM executive vice president and a family physician. As executive vice president of the ABFM, Dr. Baxley leads all aspects of ABFM activity that relate to the experience of board certified family physicians with the ABFM, including residency, early clinical years, credentials, and communications. Dr. Baxley previously served as the Senior Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and Professor of Family Medicine at the Brody School of Medicine at East Carolina University from 2012 to 2018. In that role, she pioneered curriculum redesign with emphasis on integration of training and health science, system science competencies, patient safety, quality improvement, population health, and interpersonal education. Dr. Baxley brings the experience of family physician to the ABFM and has done a superb job of making the certification project our process much more friendly for us as physicians. So uh, we should all uh, be very thankful for Dr. Baxley for that. Uh, she's been the one that has been working on uh, much of the redesign of the uh, KSA. So anybody who's done those recently, um, uh, feel free to uh, share with her how much we appreciate those KSAs going to much more of the single best question, which are so much better. Um, the other thing I'd say about Dr. Bax that I've learned is, uh, she, uh, and don't, please don't hold it against her, she is a big Clemson fan, um, but uh, we are so happy to have you with us tonight, Dr. Bax, and share with us. Um, so this first part, portion of the presentation, uh, Dr. Bax and I will tag team, uh, and so we'll kind of work back and forth. Uh, so we'll go ahead and let Dr. Bax lead off whenever you're ready. Great. Thanks, Ryan. And um, for internet stability, I'm going to cut my video off, but I wanted to be able to say hello to everybody first. Uh, before I did that. So, um, Caitlin, are you going to run slides for us? If you'll go ahead. So I want to talk a little bit tonight, really uh, focusing on updating you about the, the changes that have occurred at ABFM in the last um, really 18 months to two years and, and give, make sure everybody's aware of new options and particularly around how to tailor your certification to your needs, which has really been a focus of our work with the OAFP to try to make sure that um, family physicians can understand that this is not just a checkbox activity, 
that you're not being asked to do things that are not relevant to you, that we've really been working on relevance and burden, um, burden reduction uh, along the way. So, but I want to start just quickly with, with us all remembering why we do this um, before we talk about what. Uh, we, we don't as often talk about why we do certification, particularly uh, talking about it beyond the requirements that some hospitals and credentialers have for this. So we know for sure that it's important to our patients. And I, I talk to family docs all the time who say, I've never had a patient ask me if I was board certified. My patients don't care. And I will tell you that in 33 years of practice, I don't think I ever had a patient ask me that either. But we know because of hundreds of thousands of, um, of inquiries a year about, family phys about physicians that they're looking at, that patients do care and they want to know that they just find out before they come see us and we know from national surveys that have been done that it matters they don't understand what it takes for us to be certified but it matters to them that we are they know it's a a credential that's beyond licensure and it really represents that commitment we make for ongoing self-assessment uh, which is both uh, both cme lifelong learning but self-assessment so we can identify our knowledge gaps um, that commitment to professional behavior and values, to improving care and practice, and then being willing to submit to periodic cognitive expertise um, assessment. So, and we also know from studies that have been done that the professionalism component translates into um, actionable things like higher quality of care and fewer adverse license actions when you compare board certified family physicians to those who aren't. Next slide, Caitlin. <clears throat> you all are participating in certification, I imagine. That's why you're here tonight. And so you're aware of the four components of certification. And I've, I've really alluded to them in the why. The, these were not just things to, um, to develop to, to be a what, but to be based on a why. And each of them demonstrates a different level of commitment. As we move forward with the work that we're that ABMS is doing, American Board of Medical Specialties, with all certification boards, there's real interest in trying to integrate these components together so that they're not just distinct parts. And we can talk about that later, maybe in the Q&A. Go ahead. I'm not going to go through this, but I wanted to show you that there is a resource for you. Um, and the OAFP has this, and you'll be able to get it off of our website soon. Um, it, we, we frequently get questions. I, I, the folks who are on the, uh, on the call tonight from ABFM and others at the office will tell you that I am um, regularly say that if we could take away the time that family docs had to figure out what they're supposed to do to remain certified and just let them do the things they're supposed to do, the burden would be far less. And so we've really been working through a variety of communication channels um, to try to make it clearer what it is that you need to do, that we each need to do for certification. Um, so this is just a nice one page reference to be able to go through and say, okay, there's a, there is a pattern here. And again, I'm not gonna go through that, but it's nice to have it. Uh, and you'll see as you get to the planner later, how you can use something like this proactively. Next slide. So one of the major components that we participate in our three-year stages are self-assessment and lifelong learning activities. Mostly that's been in the form of knowledge self-assessment, previously done as SAMs along with the, with the simulation component, which has now been sunsetted. But in 2017, we brought on the continuous knowledge self-assessment, the 25 questions a quarter. Ryan's gonna talk in a lot more detail about these. Um, we also have approved alternatives that you can use for points in this category, things like the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, um, open school course around patient safety and quality, some other um, activities that other boards have that can cross over count. And the goal of all of these is really to help us identify our knowledge gaps. We know from, from abundant literature, educational literature over uh, decades, that one thing that's consistently clear is that as physicians, we, we don't always know what we don't know. In fact, we often don't know what we don't know. And one of the ways that um, certification goes beyond CME, they're both important, they're, but, but hand in hand is to 
not just have our learning be choice about what we think we don't know or we want to know more about, but to really help us identify those gaps. I will preview for you that coming in 2021, there's gonna be a new option added here just to give more choice to people based on their learning styles or what they wanna do. And it's gonna be a journal article activity that will be uh, will involve um, review of contemporary practice changing articles, things that we should start doing or stop doing in practice. And there's the National uh, Journal Article Activity um, Committee that is working on this with some very bright people around the country. So that's gonna be coming in the middle of 2021 in a pilot. Ryan's already alluded to the uh, KSA redesign. This was a, a major initiative. We're about um, not quite halfway through it now, but we'll be through by the end, uh, by the middle of 2021. And the overall changes are to transfer all KSAs to single best answer. Those of you who've done them before know that about 70% of the questions overall were multiple true faults. And while there was intention about that early on, because these were, these were intended to be very rigorous, um, the multiple true faults ends up being more like five questions in one. And when, when you have the 80% pass threshold um, for each section uh, in particular, and you were looking at multiple true faults where you might've known four out of five correctly, it became more a level of frustration that, that really could be counterproductive to learning. And the whole intent of these is learning. So they're all being converted to single best answer. Uh, I've had nobody complain about that yet. The critiques and references are all being updated. They were being updated before. There's an annual process of a, a guideline-based update, guideline change-based update, and an every three-year sort of major update. But this is a, we're doing it with a different uh, level of attention and rigor, and we've brought in some additional family doc resources um, who are working on that with us. Instead of having to have 80% correct within each, each um, subcategory, so for example, asthma, you had to have 80% correct in chronic management, 80% correct in emergency management, 80% correct in exercise induced, et cetera, et cetera. We've moved that to just an 80% correct overall, uh, which also improves the ease of going through this. There's a better platform, uh, IT platform that gives you everything at once with the question and the critique and you can move through um, much better with a better user experience. There's more to come on that. Uh, in 2021, but it's it's already much improved. And then we wanted, our board wanted to make way for some new KSAs, new topics that we thought were important. Uh, substance use disorder, multimorbidity, musculoskeletal medicine, um, uh, high value care, um, for example. And in doing so, we felt there were some that we could combine um, and, and bring together to open up some capacity for some of the new ones. So you see the table there, I'm not gonna go through it. Uh, four of them are already out and released. Some of you may have participated in them. There are uh, four additional ones uh, from six uh, with two combined down in to make a total of four that'll be done on or before the end of March of 2021. They're uh, in the final editing stages now, which will, um, really um, get finished after the first of the year. And then the third phase you can see will be uh, sometime before the end of June, at which point then we'll start to be, uh, work on new KSA topics. We have had one new one already released, which is palliative care. And that was through working with an external partner that had a knowledge development group uh, working on that. And that's been very popular. And I'm going to turn over to Ryan to go into more detail about them. Thank you. So um, look at the knowledge self-assessment. Um, hopefully everybody's been doing these, um, but these are uh, can be completed either as an individual or as a group um, and can be done even uh, as uh, groups online. Um, we do have uh, at OAP, we've been doing uh, virtual ones as well as when we can, we'll do in person again. Um, but we have one coming up in uh, February for anybody who is interested and information will be coming out on that soon. So watch for that. Uh, when you do a knowledge self-assessment, you get 10 points towards your maintenance certification requirements. And then you also get uh, eight uh, credit, CME credits uh, that uh, you can, uh, that, you, that count towards your CME requirements. Um, and so uh, 
some of these are, if you like doing these and you find these to be good, you can use them to get your other CME, even if you don't need them for maintenance certification. Uh, basically, uh, each three-year stage you're required to do one of these or some of the other things that are kind of similar to them. Um, but again, you can do more of these to get more of those 50 points that you need. Um, what these have been, uh, traditionally, it's, they're all 60 questions. Uh, traditionally, they've been um, uh, select best answer, select all correct answers, or the free text. Um, and everything is moving pretty rapidly towards the select best answer, which uh, personally, I found to be a, a much better experience because you're not spending that time trying to figure out when you know that two or three of them, what the right answers are, two or three of them are wrong, and one or two that it just depends on what study is being cited. So it's a lot less frustrating. So, so it makes a much better experience. Um, whether you're doing these as a group or whether you're doing these individually, um, you get the opportunity to go back and answer those questions as many times as you need to, to get them right. Um, and you need 80%, uh, and with new ones, 80% overall. Uh, with the older ones, 80% for each section. Um, so, so that's how you pass them. But you can go back and answer those as many times as you need to. And uh, one of the nicest things about these is once you've completed your answers, you can go back and see the discussion, as well as putting up comments. And, uh, and I know that uh, those comments are looked at, and uh, sometimes things get changed because of those comments. And so um, it's always just kind of good to see what other people are thinking, what other people know. So, so that's the knowledge self-assessment piece of it. Move to the next slide there. Um, the newer part is the continuous knowledge self-assessment. Uh, if you've not done these before, I would highly recommend this. Um, they pop up every quarter. Uh, so every three months, new ones pop up. So there's currently one open. There'll be a new one after the first of the year. Uh, these are worth 2.5 points per quarter. So basically, if you do four of these in a year, it's the same as doing one of the knowledge self-assessments. It's 25 questions. Uh, it is your option how you want to do them. You can do one question at a time. You can go back and do them all in one sitting. Um, you can do them on, on your mobile device. You can do them on your computer. Uh, they're all single best answer type questions. Uh, what, as soon as you answer the question, you then get to see a critique on it. You may use any resources you'd like to do this. When you're doing it as the continu continuous knowledge self-assessment, there is no time limit. So you can take as much time as you want to answer them. Um, and then you can see whether you got it right or not. Um, some other things that make this kind of a fun learning experience, I know we're all a little competitive, but it always tells you how difficult the question was and how many people got it right, uh, which is also kind of helpful to see and either makes you think maybe this is something I need to look a little bit more into or okay, yeah, I know this was a pretty hard question, but let me see, see what I should be doing. Um, there's also the opportunity to kind of leave your comments, read comments about the question and answer in that. So it's a good opportunity to learn and kind of uh, sometimes interact with others as well. Um, What's nice about it is if you do these regularly, it'll let you know how you're doing compared to what's expected and help you find those areas that need improvement. Um, and so, so it's a good way to kind of steer where you're doing some of your other learning. Um, now, it is important to note this is very similar to the continuous, um, uh, the, uh, the, the new uh, learning assessment that replaces boards. This is not that, this is different. Um, but this is fabulous practice because having talked to people who have started doing the FMCLA, uh, this is um, looks an awful lot of the same. The biggest difference is just the timing. Um, but basically, um, I've been doing these partly just because it's good practice for once I start uh, on that pathway. Um, and so it's a good way to practice. And, and so that's the continuous knowledge self-assessment. You can do it um, any quarter you want to. You don't have to do it every quarter. Um, but it's a great resource and kind of gives you an idea of what areas you might want to work on. Um, here is a, uh, a picture of what the website looks like and where you go to find that. If you click on, once you log in, and click on the self-assessment activities and it'll be right there at the top. And, um, and then you can either review it or it'll give you the opportunity to start or I believe it says start on it or continue on it. And, um, and that's where you can find that from the website. So right there in the middle of the page is an easy place to find that. Um, here is the, uh, Continuous knowledge self-assessment, what it looks like. Here's actually a sample question from a while back. Um, so what it does is it just gives you a question. Most of these are not super long questions, but, uh, but it gives you a little bit of background on the patient. Um, and then it asks a simple question you need to choose one correct answer for. And so, so you see this when you just click on one of these answers and then you click on it when you're ready, you hit the submit button. Next slide there. And as soon as you submit it, it tells you either you got it right or you didn't get it right. And then you can see on the right side there, it says what your peers answered. Um, and, uh, and how many people answered this question. So you can see what that looks like. Um, next slide there. You can click across and see the critique. 
So here you see that this was a fairly easy question. Um, up there at the top, it gives you kind of a rating as to how hard it was. It tells you over on the right side there what part of uh, the, the learning blueprint this is part of. And then it gives a critique that describes why this is the right answer, why the other answers are wrong, um, and gives you a little bit of background. Um, and then uh, next slide there, you can click over and see the comments. And here's basically the opportunity to see what other people are thinking. Um, and uh, yeah, sometimes some, some people seem to enjoy putting comments there uh, just when they're frustrated with some of these things. Um, but it, it, it's a nice uh, instant feedback. It's a good way to think things. And what's so nice about this is because it's new questions every quarter, uh, what you're getting is the most up-to-date information and stuff that's actually really pertinent. Um, the KSAs, they keep working on keeping them up to date, but it's different uh, than when you get to choose your 25 best questions to put forward. So these are always very up to date, very pertinent, and uh, I always find it to be a very good learning experience. Um, so that's the uh, CKSA um, 2.5, and uh, I would highly recommend those. Uh, Dr. Baxley, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thanks. So performance improvement is one of the areas I think that we, um, experience the most concerns about, the most complaints about, if you will, um, several years ago. And, and it was a, several, several categories. One, um, given the, the breadth of family medicine practice and also the variation in types of practice and, and um, not everybody does full scope, some are more focused on a, a particular area, a particular age, or maybe doing just hospice and palliative care or just urgent care or emergency department. And people were saying, you know, you, I got to do these and this isn't even what my practice is. You know, it doesn't pertain to my practice or I don't see continuity patients. The type of practice I have, um, I don't have the opportunity to do, I don't have a, a way to do this. So there's been a lot of work done the last couple of years looking at expanding the the scope of what we have for PI activities, but also creating a self-directed pathway. So the, this is sort of an algorithm approach. First of all, you do not have to have continuity to do these. There are, are a number of PI activities you can do without having a continuity practice. Um, if you do not see patients anymore, if you're an administrative only role and you, you have no patient care, then you no longer have this requirement. It made no sense to continue requiring something that people would have to come up with an administrative improvement activity, which while important, wasn't really the point of this. Um, you still have the 50 points, but you do it through the knowledge self-assessment. Um, ABFM has developed uh, activities. They also are on a new platform that are, are um, even the, the ones we had previously have been put on a new platform that's much easier to work through. Um, the, pl the platform we had was a little more difficult, a little more challenging for folks. And over the course of the last year, we've added 15 new topics. And so they are things like urgent emergent care or hospice palliative care or musculoskeletal care for those who are primarily doing sports medicine or that's their interest. Um, there's a whole range of new topics that really allow for something for really everybody um, in family medicine practice. And so that's a, there's a suite of activities there that you can choose from if you want somebody to sort of walk you through an easy way to do this. The self-directed, which has been around for a couple of years now, has really been the, a major growth area. And there's two points to the self-directed. One is self-directed is an opportunity for those of you, which is going to be the majority, I think, at this point, who are already engaged in quality improvement activities in your practice either as part of your system or part of what you're just doing intrinsically in your own practice. Self-directed is a, a really easy streamlined application for you to tell us what you're already doing. ABFM has no interest in family docs trying to do something just for ABFM. The purpose of the performance improvement requirement is so that each of us can demonstrate that as board certified family docs, we know how to reflectively look at our practices to identify a gap in practice that we need to, to close, to do something to try to close that practice and to measure and see if that, that thing that we, that intervention resulted in an improvement. So if you're already doing that, there's no need to do that separately for uh, ABFM. So self-directed is a nice way to do that if, it do, if what you wanna improve doesn't fit into some of the, the choices that are already there. The other 
place that self-directed is really nice for is for non-traditional practice folks. And so even if you're doing locums, you can do a self-directed PI activity. Um, it can be about your own documentation and how you do from one practice site to the next. I mean, there's a variety of things that can be done or something in a community. We're getting more and more attention now from folks about organizational PI activities. If you're part of a larger system or part of an, uh, an ACO or a clinically integrated network, some state chapters are sponsoring these as well, where everybody wants to work on the same initiative. Um, we're working now with a state uh, round that's, um, that the State Department of Health is trying to gear up for um, administration of COVID vaccine. And they're going to sponsor an organizational PI activity for the family physicians in that state to, in, to give them some uh, additional incentive to work with Department of Health uh, around this. And in the organizational PI activities, your organi organizational sponsor will simply attest for you. You don't have to, you can, whether it's 10 family physicians or 100 or 1,000, if you're all working on the same thing and the organizational sponsor puts in the application to ABFM and then all family docs who are working within that system and, and working on that activity will get uh, PI credit through an attestation process from the organization. There are some um, activities that the Academy does that are PI CME approved. Um, so you can look for those at the AAFP. If you're in a residency program, the Res PIP program is very much like the organizational pathway. All residency programs as part of accreditation have to do and teach in, uh, quality improvement. And so it's happening there if you're if your residency becomes a res pip sponsor all of your residents and faculty can get their performance improvement credit through an attestation process simply uh, like the organizational one uh, if the program uh, goes through the process to become that and then uh, precepting is another area where if you're your community preceptor you have students in your practice whether you're students are working with you on a quality improvement project, or you can actually have your performance improvement be about your teaching. You get evaluations from students that say, gosh, I wish that, um, that she would give me more feedback as I'm, uh, or better feedback as I'm working with her as a student. You can say, okay, I wanna improve my feedback. You can work with your local uh, school that sends students to you if they're a sponsor, and then uh, get evaluated again after you've tried some new things. And then finally, uh, we have two new activities this year, a COVID PI activity, which is a self-directed activity where you can tell us what you have done at any point in the pandemic um, that necessitated a change in your practice. Everybody has had to make a change in their practice as a result of COVID. It may have been your initial move to virtualization. It might have been over the summer trying to, to get in-person visits back and figure out which patients come for those or not. It might have been around trying to protect staff and determining protocols for, um, for how staff would get PPE or how you would um, screen patients coming in or setting up um, uh, um, parking lot uh, sort of screening. Anything you did as a result of your changes in COVID, you can submit in a very simple application and send it in uh, for that. And then over the summer, as we saw um, far more attention nationally, around issues of race, racism, health equity. Um, we also put in a health equity PI activity to encourage people, again, self-directed, you choose what you wanna do. It might be that you're looking at uh, breast cancer screening in your practice and you see a difference by race or ethnicity and you wanna close that gap. Or it could be that you wanna measure whether there's implicit bias among the, the uh, staff and partners in your practice and you wanna do something about that or you can do institute screening for social determinants of health. There's some uh, options in there, some samples of screening tools if that's something you wanted to do. But we wanna keep these to be contemporary, relevant for you, relevant for the times, and easy for you to be able to do. So a lot of upgrades in the PI activity. We also, um, Kevin Graves, I will give a shout out, you'll get to see more of Kevin later, but. Uh, really developed this PI locator. So the good news is we have a lot more activities. The bad news is we have a lot more activities. And so I'll have people say, 
oh my gosh, I opened this up and there's like 75 things to choose from. How do I know what to do? And so this is, um, think a little bit like Amazon shopping where you your preferences become known. Uh, this is a way for you when you first go into your um, portfolio in the PI section of your portfolio where you one time put in uh, information about you, your practice, your preferences, your interest. And at the end, instead of 75 things, it'll say, Dr. Kaufman, here are the six activities that are most relevant to you based on what you've told us. And it's a nice way to, you can, you can still choose from the 75. You, you always have a button to go back and look at all of them. But if, if you just need to get over that hurdle of, I don't want to spend a lot of time trying to go through 75 things, this really helps to, to give you those things that, that it looks like would be most relevant to you. So if you haven't done that yet, I would encourage you to do that. And I think Ryan's going to walk you through that as well. And that's right now. So this is looking a little bit more detail at the, the practice improvement activities. Um, uh, just to, to go on what, what was on the, on the previous couple slides, um, the new platform is incredibly incredible improvement. Um, I did the self-directed for COVID. Um, the actual improvement took the long part, but the actual uh, filling out the form for it took me about 20 minutes. Um, so it is it is that quick and easy to get the credit. So um, again, looking kind of at, at, at uh, the selection tool, you put in some practice information. So for example, here you can see, um, are you currently providing continuity care or not? Um, the uh, big thing here, if you're saying you're not provide uh, on, on this is talking about continuity care. If you're not doing patient care at all, the, the big warning I give you, you can switch back and forth. Um, but I believe it's still the case. And so if maybe if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, if you switch and say you are not taking care of patients, and then you switch it back, you're going to end up having to do two quality improvement projects. So you want to make sure that you don't hit that unless you mean to hit that. But if in a cycle you need to change it, that's fine to change it. But on this tool here, you basically say, are you taking care of continuity patients or not? What kind of settings are you seeing patients in? Um, give some information about practice size and those things. You can go ahead and hit the next button there. Um, and then it gives you opportunity for other opportunities. So uh, this is one I always like to highlight here. If you have had um, certain things you've done through your practice. So for example, patient-centered medical home or NCQA diabetes certification or uh, some of these kinds of things, you can get credit for um, get credit for the things you've already done. So you don't need to do another project on top of it. You can claim that credit and it's as simple as just uh, uploading your certificate and then that credit will appear for you there. So, so that, that's a good opportunity there. Next slide. Um, and yeah, here's again where you can say you're clinically active or not and um, it gives you that. And then it will tell you, okay, here's how many activities you have that are relevant to you, which make it really easy. Next slide there. And then here it gives a list is what it, what it gave for me. Um, and you can look through these and see if you like them. If you don't like them, you can look for other things. You can search for activity by name. Um, and these self-directed pathways are a great way to kind of choose, choose what you like. Um, on any of these, it gives you all different kinds of search terms. So if you have a disease state that you really want to work on, it'll give you, you can look up options by that. And then you can view them and uh, hit the button there. I think it, uh, the next slide will show you, show you what that looks like there. Oh. Nope, um, uh, but yet you can view, get more information about then choose it and start the, the pathway. Um, the, the nice way about the way these things work is if you look at a project and you start it and say, hey, this is what I wanna do. And then you get into the project and decide that's not really what you wanna do. You can stop it at any point and do another one. Just because you started one doesn't mean you can't change and do something else, but you do need to get all the way through if you wanna get credit for it. Um, you go to the next slide there and talk about self-directed uh, clinical pathway. Um, this is a fabulous way. Um, these various self-directed pathways are a great way to be able to take any project that you're doing or anything that's important to you and applying it. So this gives uh, an example of pretty much the questions you could ask. Uh, so you have to give your project a name. Uh, you have to kind of state what the, what the project's going to be and then what your goal is. Um, you set a time frame, and this could be kind of any time frame you want. It kind of depends on what project you're doing. And then you just need to choose a measure. And this doesn't need to be something terribly complicated. You can just do chart review on uh, 10 charts, something like that for before and after, uh, or you can pull data out of your electronic health record. It's, it's set up so that you can do this however works for you. Um, so in this example uh, that, that we use, uh, looking at smoking, you could say, okay, I'm gonna look at 10 charts and I'm gonna look at teenagers and then look if I'm, uh, how I'm doing about looking at uh, e-cigarette use. Um, and so for this example, if you review those 10 charts at the beginning and four of them, 
uh, had it and your goal is to get above 85% and then you do your intervention and then afterwards you get 90%, that's great. You've shown you're made, you've made a difference in practice. Um, a key uh, thing to note on this is you don't actually have to show improvement uh, in order to get credit. Now, we sure hope that you'll see some improvement when you do these things, but as we all know, sometimes things seem like a great idea on paper and don't quite pan out. Um, what you're getting credit for is the process of working for improvement. So uh, even if you turns out your rate's worse on your follow-up, it may be a sampling issue or it may be that it didn't get any better. Um, and it may be that you choose not to continue that intervention going forward. However, what you get credit for is you get credit for having implemented the process. Uh, next slide. And so uh, we have uh, currently online, uh, there's a couple links here uh, showing basically how to use these, uh, some of these self-directed pathways, they're videos that, that I've made. They'll kind of walk you through one step at a time of how you can apply this. So we have one both for the COVID-19 uh, self-directed pathway, as well as the uh, health disparities and health equity self-directed uh, clinical uh, performance improvement activity. Uh, and basically these are short videos that you can view and we'll show you one, step at a time, you click here, you click there, this is how you make it through this process. And so, so that makes it even easier to look at. One of the things that we wanted to be sure to emphasize is that, that our goal, uh, in addition to increasing relevance and decreasing burden is to really give people choice to um, pick the path that they want. So uh, it's, if you've been doing this for any length of time um, and, and been participating in certification, you probably thought about it, something along the lines of, well, I have to do three KSAs or SAMs at that point and one PI activity, and that's how I meet my requirements. And you certainly can still do that, but we wanted people to be able to, to uh, have a menu of options and to design their plate <laughs> the way they want to. And you'll see that again uh, later when the Ohio folks are talking about the, the way to, um, to be able to, to set your own certification plan. So you could do CKSA for a few quarters. You can do it for 12 quarters, get all your, your knowledge self-assessment points, um, get 30 points with that over three years, and then just do, your self -direct, do a self-directed PI activity and you're done. Um, or you can mix and match CKSA and KSA. Um, you can actually, uh, PI activities are 20 points. If you turn in something for a COVID related and you do another PI activity, then you only have one KSA to do or four quarters of CKSA. So it, it doesn't have to be sort of two thirds knowledge and one third PI. If you're really doing a lot of quality improvement work, you can submit two of those. So. The, the points can add up any way that you want to, and there are a variety of ways to get there. So we don't want people to feel locked into, it must be done this way. You can really, you can dial your own. That was a self-assessment piece of things. Now talking about kind of the exam part of it or the, uh, the knowledge assessment piece of it. So. Traditionally, uh, what we've all done is our one day family medicine uh, certification process. Um, it used to be longer than that, but, uh, but in recent years, it's been going to test center. Uh, you have two opportunities a year to do it. Uh, and you can either do it the year that it's last year, or you can do it a year prior if you want to. Uh, basically, if um, not successful, then you can uh, reattempt uh, re it and do it again. Um, it is four 95 minute sections uh, with 75 questions and uh, then some break time. Uh, it used to be for those of us who's been a few years since we took it, we used to have where we would choose a topic uh, to do some sec uh, do a section on. Uh, that was taken away. It's kind of interesting. Uh, what the numbers sh showed us was that people actually did worse on that section than the general section. So that's part of why that went away. Um, and uh, so that module option isn't there anymore. Uh, all these questions are single best uh, answer, a multiple choice format questions. Um, and then they're there where it is secure computer based uh, for everybody who remembers the fun of going through and having to empty your pockets and take pictures of empty pockets and uh, make sure you're not taking anything with you. So that's, that's the way we've traditionally done these. Um, but now uh, we have a new way to, uh, to do this assessment that doesn't, isn't quite so stressful for many of us. 
Yeah, so um, Ryan talked a lot about the CKSA earlier, and you'll see this model. The CKSA, uh, when we started in 2017, was really intended to be a test bed to see if this would work in a way that we could move it to an alternative for the exam, which we did uh, in, first in 2019. So we sort of did a two-year pilot in the in the knowledge self-assessment to be able to understand what we needed to do here. So longitudinal assessment is an alternative to the exam. And if you get to your year that it's your year to take the exam, right now in the pilot, you can't start this a year early the way you could take the exam a year early, but you will you start it if it if it was um, if my year was 2020 to take the exam I could have started this January uh, for example 25 questions per quarter you do it your time your location your own pace which is very different than uh, than the all day in the test center so you can do a few at a time you can do all at one time you can do them in the comfort of your home or office or wherever you have good Wi-Fi. Uh, a big difference is you can use references, uh, all except for phone a friend. You don't want to, you can't ask, ask a colleague because these are secure test items. But it's intended to mirror what we do in practice. The goal is not to have people look up every one, uh, although in, in early tar parts, phases of participation, people kind of nervously want to do that because it's the exam. Um, but it's really, the, the items are like the exam. Most of them are intended to be walk around knowledge that we would all have, but we all know that in practice, we do look things up. And so this is mirroring that you can use written references. They are timed, that's the difference. When somebody says, how can I tell the difference of whether I'm doing CKSA or FMCLA? My easy answer is if there's no clock, you're not doing FMCLA. <laughs> Because we've had some people thinking they were participating when they were actually doing the CKSA. So we've really tried to separate these. The timing is because it really is a test. Um, it, it, it is a substitute for the test or an alternative for the test. It, in actuality, even though five minutes makes people some people anxious, we have now over two years of data that show that the average time it takes is around two minutes, 17 seconds per question and very few people go beyond the five minutes. Um, and it turns out that that's more of an adjustment action reaction than it is a real uh, barrier. You do get the critiques and references. Again, a major difference to when we were taking the one day exam, you'd walk out of the exam and think, well, I don't have any idea how I did. You, you know as you're going how you do here. But more importantly, uh, and a real goal of longitudinal assessment is that you're learning as you go. So. It, it, you're being assessed, your knowledge is being assessed, but we're learning. And the feedback we've gotten most commonly from the first two cohorts is, wow, I actually learned something this quarter that I was able to put into practice in my practice immediately. And that would have never happened with the one day exam. You have to take 300 questions over four years. So doing the quick math on that, you could be done in three years if you did all questions all through all four quarters. But we recognize that life happens and that people sometimes need breaks. They sometimes have things like, I don't know, a pandemic, um, other things. Uh, we didn't anticipate that, but the intent was that rather personal illness, family illness, fabulous vacation, partner going out on leave for a period of time, any sorts of things where you might say, wow, this is not the quarter for me to take time to do anything other than what I have to do. You've got four options for that over the, over the four years. The pilot started in 2019. We extended it to 2020 and now to 2021. So if you um, are not participating, but you are due to take your exam in 2021, you'll still have the choice of the one day exam. Some people still prefer it. We're not getting rid of it. But uh, around close to 80% of eligible folks are choosing the longitudinal pathway so far. We do anticipate long-term implementation of this. Uh, we will be going to ABMS uh, for approval of this coming out of pilot into full implementation in uh, April of 2021. And we don't see anything that, that um, is giving us any signal that that's gonna be a problem. So I, would, I can't formally tell you that, but I can tell you that you should anticipate this will, whenever your year comes, this will be an option for you. Next slide. Um, it, it looks like this. This is a way to sort of graphically see how you move from one quarter to the next. 
it is uh, good to know that in the first year, we have a meaningful participation requirement um, of 80 questions so that you don't say, well, I've got four years and I can take four quarters off. I'm going to take the first two quarters off. We really want people to get into the rhythm of doing this. Um, it is helpful to participants to sort of be forced to have that meaningful participation in that first year, after which you can um, you can have your, your time off. As we go into full implementation, we're looking at that and saying, you know, should it be 75 instead of 80? Because life could happen in the first year. So we're looking at some possible changes there um, that'll come out with, the, with full implementation. If along the way at any point you say, I don't like this, I, I don't want to have to deal with this all the time, I'm, I'd be fine to do the one day exam, you can drop out. You have a year to uh, take the one day exam and still maintain your certification uh, through that time as long as you take the one day exam in the, in the upcoming year. You, at the end of the first year, you get uh, a preliminary performance dashboard. Uh, it looks like a speedometer and you can see how you're doing relative to the passing score. So you can see if you need to improve your score or mostly what people find is they're reassured. They're like, oh, okay, I got this. I'm doing okay. I just can keep going. Um, but you, you will get that and it's like the, the Bayesian score predictor that Ryan was talking about earlier with the CKSA. You can, you'll know how you're doing all along the way. At the end of the time, if you are unsuccessful, you, you do score below the minimum passing standard. You, your certification is still extended for that extra year, giving you two options to take the one-day exam, which would be how you would have to do it to maintain your certification. Next slide. So just some numbers. Um, I said 80%. It was close to 80% in 2020. Whether people chose the one-day exam or longitudinal assessment, their reason was the same, convenience. So some were, it was more convenient to do it once and not have to deal with it for some years. And for others, it was more, it, the convenience was I get to do this when I want to, how I want to. Um, people are very happy with the process, the web interface, the navigation. We talked about the clock, um, anxiety is less. And as I mentioned, the, the biggest feedback is I'm learning as I go. Next slide. Um, we also are finding that people are rating this as more relevant to family medicine. Um, very often on the one day exam, we'd get feedback like, well, I don't do this in my practice. And as I have thought about that some, my uh, explanation for that is, when I would walk out of the one day exam every 10 years, what would I remember when I walked out the door? I would remember those 10 questions that absolutely drove me nuts because I wasn't working at the hospital at that point and I wasn't gonna be able to answer that question about management of insulin drips or you know, whatever you, um, or uh, there was something that, that it wasn't something I was doing in my practice. But that's what I would remember. It wasn't, that was five or 10 questions out of 300, but that's what you think about. On, and so, they, so you'd say, when you did your evaluation, this isn't relevant for me. In fact, these are the same items. But as you're working through them on a quarterly basis, you get the chance to do look up and you get the chance to think about your practice. More people um, felt that it was relevant. It, really the most important thing is that to us is that 75% of people said, I sought out more information on a clinical topic after doing this. Well, that's the whole point. It's, it's assessment, but it's also learning. And if, if it's accomplishing that, we've really, uh, we've accomplished our goal. Uh, people are continuing to participate. The very few drop out, as you see there. You can go ahead to the next slide. Uh, Ryan's already covered this, so we can skip over that. And then finally, I just want to mention uh, related to COVID related. Oh, somebody had asked in the chat, I saw it popped up. Let me say about FMCLA, about the scoring. Um, currently, as we're working through comparing, comparing the psychometrics, which is the last step of, uh, that we have to complete before it goes to be a full implementation, uh, the cut scores for this are the same as the cut scores for the exam. So uh, I don't anticipate that that will really change going forward because it's looking like one of the things we had to show is this was comparable. Is this telling us the same thing about a family physician that's doing this? The passing scores look similar. The item difficulties look the same. And so, um, so there's not a different score for this at this stage, uh, even with the lookup. Um, relative to COVID, 
um, because we recognize uh, very, we recognize very early on, and uh, the what what you all experienced in the spring and are are unfortunately now experiencing again in terms of surges, that family docs, all frontline physicians have a lot going on right now, and need to be able to to have a way to pause um, their certification activities if they need to. So all 2020 deadlines were extended to the end of 2021. So if you were due for the exam this year, and we're seeing people um, who take the one day exam who are saying, you know, I could take it now, but I'm 68 years old. I'm living in Houston. Uh, I don't want to go to a test center and take a chance. I will say that Prometric has done a phenomenal job and we have really not seen any problems related to the test center, but but understandably, this is the time when some people may not want to do that, or they can't leave their practice to do it, or, you know, if they've had personal illness. So stage requirements, the exam requirement, um, all of those were moved. We had to move the April exam for residents to July for safety purposes, because Prometric really did need to shut down at that point. Um, we adjusted the meaningful participation requirements for the 2020 folks from 80 questions to 50. So they could take that time off in the first year um, that we had planned for them not to. Um, and there was an option to defer payments to 2021. Now, having said that, we do we are reminding folks um, that this is a extension, and what it and by virtue of that, your new stage would begin in January. So if you do need to um, postpone or extend time working on on your three-year stage activities there you're, you're sort of front-loading your next stage you have to finish this stage before you start it so we are encouraging and we're seeing we're not off by much people are not people are generally staying uh, participating in the spring family docs were finding they had a lot of time on their hands many of them who weren't in the hospital and were actually doing it because they had time that they weren't seeing patients in there practice yet so um, and then residency for those of you who are in, in training programs um, the 1650 requirement was changed so that virtual visits would also be able to count for that um, we rely on program director attestation and as we go forward in this year we're not going to hold um, hold those requirements we're not going to we're not going to prohibit a resident from becoming board eligible at the end of their training because they're under 1650. If the program director and the CCC say this resident is competent and ready for autonomous practice. So we still set the goal for 1650. It can be a mix of virtual and in-person, but we also are not going to have any family physician lose their certification or any resident be ineligible for certification if they have been able to, if their program director says they're ready to, they're ready to go. So, um, so, and as we go through this year, people are saying, well, that was last year's graduating class. What about this year? We're following along with ACGME and whatever, uh, the, the program director attestation is simply that the resident has met all their ACGME requirements. So when ACGME says, they're going to make uh, accommodations. Those will apply also for board eligibility. And okay. I think we're to the questions. So uh, we're a little bit uh, behind on schedule. So we'll take just a couple of minutes for questions. Before I do that, I'd make one other comment about the uh, FMCLA as well as the uh, CKSA. Um, since I could say this and the ABFM people can't, um, great resources to have open when you're doing those things. Uh, if you want to use resources, it is American Family Physician. Uh, so pull up the website there because there's an incredible number of questions that are based on American Family Physician articles. Um, the US Preventive Services Task Force, uh, there's a lot of uh, questions that come from those, and CDC. And those re three resources seem to cover an awful lot of the materials. So. Um, so those are great resources to have if you want resources. At this point, we'll take just a couple minutes for questions. Uh, if you'll put questions in the uh, in the uh, uh, chat, that'd be great. And uh, we will get to those questions uh, or we'll have people answer them, but we'll just take a couple minutes for that if there are pressing questions people have. I can take a couple of them verbally. So the 
when you start FMCLA, you start at the year you would normally have taken the exam. So if I was due for the exam in 2020, instead of choosing April or November 2020, I would, I would use my sign-up period, which is, would be in the fall of 2019, and I would pick FMCLA and I would start in January. So it's not the pl year plus one, it's the year that you normally would be doing the exam. We also, uh, the Academy is about to, we're about to work through with the Academy uh, CME credit for FMCLA, just like when you take the one day exam, you get CME credit for your study prep for that. And we're working through that to get CME credit there. Uh, somebody asked the question to repeat what the resources that I that I would use. The resources that I would look at is American Family Physician. So if you go afp.org front slash AFP, uh, U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, uh, and um, also CDC. Some people do use up to date. The thing I would say is pick a couple that you really like that are your go tos uh, that are broad and have those up in a separate browser and don't try to use too many. And for goodness sakes, please don't Google. Um, Lookup can also cause people to get down rabbit holes where they lose time. And in some cases, and it's not uncommon that you know the answer or you've got it down to the choice of two, uh, one or the other of, of two choices. And people will change what was the right answer because they find some article that convinces them differently. So Lookup is a is both a good thing and a bad thing. You want to use it wisely. And the thing I would say is, is use this opportunity to do the CKSA because it gives you great practice. One of the really nice things about the critiques is you can look and see which articles are being used and what's being referenced. And that'll be very helpful as you're preparing for further questions. Um, somebody else had asked the question about uh, recertification in 2023. Can you start uh, FMCLA now? And the answer is no. Uh, but what you can do is do the CKSA you can set your own timer if you want to start practicing it that way, um, because the questions look incredibly similar um, and it's great practice. So that's a great way to do that. We do hear from a lot of people that they want, they're ready to start FMCLA now. And that one of the things we're talking about is going forward, once it becomes, it comes out of pilot is would that, would there be an option to do that? So I don't, we don't have an answer yet, but we're certainly hearing that from people and we're considering it. Okay, well, I think we'll move on to our next section because we're running a little tight on time. If you have further questions, feel free to post those to the chat and we'll keep responding to those. Uh, but next up, I'd like to turn the things over to uh, Aaron and Kevin from the ABFM. Uh, they will be highlighting some changes that are being made to the physician portfolio. Um, I've been a member of the focus group that's looking at these changes and I wanna say I am very excited about these. I think you'll all really like to see what they're doing. It's making this a whole lot more interactive, a whole lot easier to use. Um, and so, so I'm excited to uh, see what they have to show us. Um, and uh, we will uh, want to make this as interactive as we can because um, basically uh, they'll be sharing stuff with us and this is still in the design process. So if, please do share any feedback that you have uh, because that does uh, shape what uh, this is going to look like for us going forward. So thank you to both for all your hard work to make this look better. Aaron, go ahead and take this away and show us what you've got. Okay, great. Thanks, Dr. Kaufman. Uh, just to throw up our information again, uh, my name is Erin Myrie. I'm the cert Certification Program Manager. And then also with me tonight, I have Kevin Graves, who is the Strategic Projects Manager. He's actually become uh, quite the UX expert, though, this year as we've worked through this project. Uh, so I'd like to go ahead and start with... Um, just to, to revisit what the current portfolio looks like in case there are some of you that haven't logged in in a while. Um, we have a test environment set up tonight so we can kind of refresh memory. Uh, so can everybody see the uh, old portfolio? Perfect. Okay, great. Um, so you'll notice that we have this big orange box on the screen. Um, we were intending to use that for alerts um, and quick links, but sometimes things get lost inside of there. Um, we also have multiple links that are listed throughout the page. And if you aren't really familiar with our portfolio, uh, you might also miss the fact that your requirements are listed up here in this top right corner. So uh, this was something that was um, introduced several years ago and um, pretty much we decided that this was the year 
um, to make the improvement. So just to kind of catch you up on where we have been so far, um, last summer we started out with um, setting up a list of guiding principles. Uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, the physician was the main focus of this project. We created everything with the physician in mind. Uh, we never wanted to say if, if we already knew the information, we never wanted to ask for information that we already knew. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we were showing what their current status was. Uh, we wanted to show what was next. And most importantly, we wanted to let the physician know when they were complete. So um, believe it or not, that's a call that we frequently get is just looking for that reassurance that they are in fact complete with their certification requirements. So. Uh, one of the main focuses there. Uh, we also wanted to keep it clean and pur purpose driven. Uh, we wanted it to be mobile responsive. I don't know if you've tried to look at your physician portfolio on your mobile device, but it is, uh, it's a little hard to navigate on an, an iPhone. So we wanted to keep that in mind. And then uh, most importantly, we wanted to engage our um, customers frequently throughout this process to make sure that we were on the right path. Um, we wanted to focus on achieving a solution that is effective, but something that we can continue to improve upon so that we don't end up in the same situation here in a couple years. So uh, we did all that back in the summer last year. FMX was our first opportunity in the fall where we went in to get feedback um, from multiple family physicians. Uh, we interviewed people at the booth. We had separate sessions set up. So lots of great feedback came out of that. Um, we created a C version, uh, went into re writing requirements in January, thought we had, you know, a great start. And then, of course, uh, March and April hit, everything caught on fire. So we had some recovery to do there. And then finally, in June, we were able to test and uh, post our first page to our soft launch group that Dr. Kaufman alluded to is a small group of physicians that we have asked to be um, our beta testers, our guinea pigs, where we're pushing out this new view for them. They're using their own data and interacting with the pages to let us know if we're on the right track. So um, I would be remiss if I didn't show you where we started last fall. So this is kind of like showing um, an old yearbook photo. It's a little bit embarrassing, but uh, when we went to FMX, we had two versions. Uh, this was our first version and uh, we thought, you know, this was when we knew everything. Uh, this was the solution that everybody was going to love. And what we got was they didn't know where to start. It was somewhat anxiety inducing because there's so much on the page. Um, so we kind of had to move away from that. Our second version uh, was a little bit calmer, um, but again, lots of text. Uh, we still weren't hitting it out of the park on this one. So no home run came out of FMX. We had to go back and uh, hit the drawing board again. So this is where if I were Clark Griswold, I would be asking for a drum roll so that I can show you our fabulous new design, uh, or at least what I hope you think is fabulous. So this is uh, the new ABFM physician portfolio. Uh, we've gone with some uh, calm color schemes. We are focusing on keeping that uh, personalized view. If you've never logged into your portfolio before, uh, we're gonna give you an overview of the certification process right up front, uh, both in text and visually, so that you can kind of articulate where you're gonna go throughout this process. Uh, we are focused on letting you know that you are in fact the one that's logged in, uh, believe it or not, not, we receive feedback that um, in this example, Dr. Smith, maybe there's a Dr. Darren Smith and a Dr. Katie Smith in the same house. So they uh, shared a home computer who's logged into the screen. So uh, a couple of easy things that we were able to go back and update um, so that they knew that the portfolio was actually set up for them. Also focusing on what their current requirements are and what their current stage is. Uh, that was something else that was also confusing in the other portfolio, knowing what those exact dates were and what had to be completed during that time. So now we're trying to put that up front, uh, right when the physician logs in, it's on their dashboard, it's interactive. So if you click your certification activities card, instantly you can see what your current status is, what you've completed and what you have remaining. Uh, we're trying to show that in uh, visual with the pie chart and also so in text um, with all of the descriptions there. Um, not that we would have anybody on this call that would be part of that group, but just to kind of show you how we're trying to use visual cues, I also have an example of uh, how we're using colors 
to prompt people. So uh, we have another example of a physician whose stage would actually end uh, December 31st of 2021. So, or of 2020, I'm sorry. So you can see right here, we're trying to use colors to prompt the physician to say, hey, um, you're coming up on a deadline. We need you to take action in some form here. So um, we called this an angry orange. We can't use red because that's anxiety inducing. So we got to the closest color that we could. So I know that none of you will um, fall into that category but if you start to see colors change, that means that it's time to take action. Um, so going back to our other example with Dr. Smith. So if we looked at his activities card, um, we also consulted with our support center on this page to see what were we uh, most frequently getting calls about. And a lot of the times people just call and they wanna know what do I need to do to complete my stage as Dr. Baxley, Dr. Kaufman alluded to in the slide deck, there's multiple combinations, but we have a couple that we typically recommend. We went ahead and posted those on, on the dashboard so that um, it might help the physician take that information to move along versus uh, sitting on hold. Uh, um, waiting to talk with someone. We always love to hear from our physicians. So of course, if you have questions, feel free to call in, but um, this will provide you with links directly to those activities that we're commonly gonna recommend. Um, if you look at the licensure um, card, you can see that in this example, Dr. Smith is up to date with his license requirement, but if he needed to make a change or add additional licenses, he could click this link and it would instantly take him to, whoops, I'm out of order. There we go, the license page. Um, from this, he could add a license, update, report, incorrect data, all from that page. Back on the dashboard, if we looked at CME, um, in this example, all of the CME is complete. So that pie chart again is, is showing that green is complete, it's successful, uh, something that you don't have to worry about. If that physician actually did have CME that was due, same type of uh, visual diagram as they might see on the activities card, where it's gonna show what they have completed thus far, what's incomplete. Uh, you can, uh, in your all's case, uh, we can, receive all of your information from the academy so you don't have to worry about self-reporting it and then you can see that here this is a change from our current portfolio where we only show if you've met that 150 cme mark or not so that was somewhat anxiety inducing too so we've made changes there to show that incremental progress so we think that that'll be beneficial as well uh, same with certification fees, we've made updates there. Uh, one of our most frequent calls is for copies of receipts. If you're looking to expense uh, your certification fees with maybe your employer um, or for whatever purpose that might be, you can come to this page now. Uh, you can pay in advance if you choose so. Um, back to the dashboard. The the exam card, uh, we had a physician that just posted in the chat uh, that they were uh, up for their exam requirement in 2023. Well, uh, as that deadline approaches, the online application will appear in this card. So right from the dashboard, you could log in and see that that application was available and um, instantly move from that without multiple clicks that you'd have to do today in the current portfolio. I do have one picture um, since we have spent a lot of time talking about the FMCLA um, to show you what that card would look like. And um, as the physician progresses through FMCLA and reaches that 100 question point, um, you can see your scaled score report. So that would also appear on your dashboard. So if you wanted to launch into the application, if you wanted to access uh, some of the reports that are available, uh, if you wanted to look at just frequently asked questions about FMCLA, all of that could be done from your dashboard card as well. Okay, so our first doodle poll question, and I'm gonna call on Caitlin for this. So if we went back to that original version of the physician portfolio with the big orange box, the requirements up in the corner, what we wanna know is, do you see uh, an improvement in identifying what your certification requirements are with this new design? So that's gonna be our first question. And you can tell me, no, it's not gonna hurt my feelings. That just means we have to go back to the drawing board. <laughs> oh, and I got one person that says I have to go back to the drawing board. 
So hopefully uh, that person has captured my email address at some point during this. I'll make sure to post that back up there because I'd love to hear from you um, and get your feedback on that. It's much better to get the feedback now before we roll out to all of the physicians. Okay, perfect. Okay, so the next feature that I wanted to point out is the addition of a search bar. So one of the things that we were missing in our other portfolio is if you went into uh, the portfolio and you didn't exactly know where to find what you were looking for, if you were new to certification or things have moved since the last time you logged in, uh, stages are three years and sometimes things uh, can move during that time. So we've introduced uh, the, uh, the uh, search feature close that doodle poll out. Uh, so now at the top of the uh, dashboard, the physician could just type in exam and that will show them all of the places inside the physician portfolio where the exam is mentioned. They can also look at sources inside the support center page now that's going to provide knowledge based articles and then also on the public site uh, where exam might be mentioned. So hopefully within that space they could find the information that they were looking for for exam. So based on other feedback that we've received from uh, focus groups, I wanted to do the next pseudo poll to see if you recognize that there was a search bar on the dashboard before I pointed it out. Yeah, that's what. So yeah, it looks like the majority is saying no. Uh, that is one of the areas that we've identified that we need to improve upon because if we don't point it out, it is kind of hidden on the page with all of the other things going on. So great feedback. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, scrolling on down the dashboard page, we now have a new section called My Activities. And the purpose of this is to quickly launch you into things that you might have bookmarked or things that you might have already started. Uh, Dr. Kaufman showed uh, in his presentation earlier where you could find CKSA. Well, if you've started CKSA at some point, now it's going to show up on your dashboard. So it's instantly log in and there it is on your page. Uh, no more multiple clicks to get to that application. So hopefully making that easier to find. Um, we also have uh, introduced what we're calling a knowledge center where we can rotate cards in and out based on maybe the, the time of year. What are people frequently calling to ask about? Verification letter is always an important thing. Uh, encouraging people to volunteer is now listed on there because that's something that we're looking forward um, to getting more feedback from physicians on things and then also the help and support page where uh, physicians could go out. Um, they could find uh, knowledge based articles. They could find things that we've recently updated. Uh, one of the, the great things that Dr. Kaufman pointed out is that we shouldn't include things unless we have information there. So if you go to troubleshooting and support videos right now, we don't have any information. So uh, it, that's on us between now and launch to post things out there. If not, we need to take them off because that's exactly right. We shouldn't um, have a tab there if that's not there. Uh, the other uh, great new feature that we have is that if you don't find the information that you're looking for, you can actually create your own support request uh, right inside your physician portfolio. So say you had a question about self-assessment and uh, when are the next CKSA questions released? You could um, add any supporting information that you wanted to, and then you submit your qu request right there inside the portfolio. This actually creates a ticket with our ABFM Support Center. So uh, during business hours, they will come back in and they will respond to this ticket. If you wanted to come in and check your status, you can also do that from right inside your physician portfolio. So here's the ticket that we just submitted. Um, if there were interactions with the support center agent, it would all be posted inside of here. Um, you can also resolve your ticket if you happen to come across the answer on your own. Um, you can reply to the support center agent if there's additional information that maybe you found since then. Or um, you can also reference back to a closed ticket if uh, you had the same problem, but it's been a long time since you had it. You can't quite remember how that was resolved. You can actually go back into the ticket and use that for future reference. 
So the next doodle poll question is, um, if you had an issue that required contacting the ABFM, uh, would you be likely to call us, which is totally acceptable? Uh, would you be likely to chat us, which we offer this feature in the bottom corner of the screen at all times? Or would you be likely to email us at help at the ABFM.org or submit a support request? Okay, great. Thank you all for the feedback. So the other page that I'd like to show is the profile page. And this is really the page that we have focused on um, really personalizing for the physician. Uh, we're trying to put any kind of information uh, pertaining to that physician on this page so that it's easily accessible. Uh, we're making changes so that information could be um, updated a little bit easier um, with uh, adding uh, the support ticket feature in some instances. Uh, we have links on things where there might be questions. We've introduced fly-in pages uh, so that you can still see the information on the original page. You're not navigated down some rabbit hole that you don't know how to get back out of. So um, focusing on the usability there. Uh, if you wanted to personalize your page a little bit more, we're offering the opportunity to upload an image. So um, for Dr. Smith, I will date myself and post uh, one of my favorite doctors uh, from high school. <laughs> so uh, you're more than welcome to personalize your physician portfolio or not. Um, really, this is just a page geared towards the physician. Uh, you want to be able to see your clinical status, which we talked about earlier. Um, you can track your history here. Um, I just wanted to clarify that we do encourage uh, that you don't change your clinical status if it's something that is just um, a vacation or a short-term short leave of absence. This is really intended to be a long-term status change. And um, if you do decide that you want to go from uh, clinically inactive back to clinically active, uh, that does require the completion of one PI activity if you haven't already completed it in your stage. So it I just wanted to clarify on that, that it is uh, completing one PI activity to change uh, to clinically active. If you have any other questions, so feel free to throw them in the chat and we'll clarify that later. Um, also wanted to show that you could edit your uh, communication settings coming soon. We'll be able to um, hopefully edit communication preferences where you can set frequency of reminders and, and such there. Um, we talked about the um, activity preferences. So also capturing that information in this space. As I mentioned, we have a robust library now of certification activities. So providing this preference information will help us to narrow down um, the search on that to something that, that maybe is of interest, but yet uh, satisfies an open requirement that you have. And then also exam results um, will be located on this page. Uh, one of the most important features of this page, for me at least, is the introduction of the ability to give feedback. So even if you're not involved in the soft launch group, um, if you aren't able to participate in a fo focus group at any point, um, you still have the ability to provide feedback inside your physician portfolio. We welcome that. Um, we are transitioning to an environment of continuous improvement on our website, and uh, we want to continue to receive that feedback um, because as you can see today, we're not always spot on. Uh, there's always room for improvement. So please jump in there and provide feedback. Okay. So moving on to our purpose tonight, because I know we're kind of short on time. As Dr. Kaufman mentioned, we have partnered with the Ohio Academy on the development of a certification planner tool. And uh, this really stemmed from uh, the idea of not procrastinating to the end of the stage and identifying what it is that you actually need to do to complete your stage requirements. So coming up next, uh, we'll have a preview of that certification planner. Uh, it's a great opportunity to provide feedback, to talk about usability, uh, to talk about um, your likeliness to use it. Um, if there's things that we could change to make it more uh, user friendly, then definitely this is the opportunity to discuss that. And then also I wanted to to throw in the tag that everybody who decides to stick around after the break will be registered for a, a drawing of an Amazon card. So, <laughs> 
Are there any questions about what I've, I've shown tonight? Okay, then I'll hand it back over to you, Dr. Kaufman. Uh, thank you to Dr. Baxley, to Aaron, to Kevin for the great presentations. Um, this is the end of our CME approved portion of the, of the session, but hopefully you will uh, stick around for the rest of it. Um, we hope that uh, everybody now feels a little more confident in your board certification requirements and knows a little bit more about what it means to be board certified. Uh, please reach out to uh, Caitlin McGuffey at the OAFP or any one of us on the presentation tonight with other questions or other feedback you have for us. Uh, as a reminder, an evaluation was emailed to you earlier tonight, uh, or earlier today. Uh, please fill that out and return it to Caitlin, um, and then she will send you a CME certificate for your file once that's completed. Uh, you do need to report your CME to the AFP so that it's self-reported. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take a, just a quick five-minute break, let everybody uh, stretch your legs um, if they need to, um, uh, and uh, we will make sure that uh, we have the uh, we do have these slides and uh, information to share with you about this new certification planner. So we're going to take just a little bit more time to do that in about another 20 minutes here um, after our five-minute break. Um, it's also a good opportunity to give some more uh, uh, in-person feedback. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so uh, uh, Aaron and Kevin have uh, really worked on the document that some of you have seen earlier in the year that we were working with and uh, making it much more interactive. And this is something we're gonna see in the position portfolio soon. So um, it's still in the, the planning stages and we really would appreciate more feedback. So if you have time to spare, uh, do stick around uh, and we will get a chance to look at what this tool's looking like and you'll have your opportunity to help shape what this looks like in the future. So. Uh, thank you all for joining us. We're going to take about a, a five minute break and uh, about 825, uh, we're going to uh, rejoin and uh, go over this certification tool. So thank you very much for everybody for your participation tonight. If you have other questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we will get right back to you on those. So thank you.